Good morning. Welcome to uh, worship at First Baptist Church. It's chilly, but sunny, so we'll take it. We have uh, quite a few announcements this morning. Um, Tuesday, there will be an interfaith Thanksgiving service that will be at 7 p.m. at the Zion Episcopal Church, if anyone would like to attend. Uh, there are some new ministers in town, so if you're interested in meeting them, that would be a good opportunity. Thursday, happy Thanksgiving, and if you would like to join Craig and Kay Keith for a Thanksgiving meal, please let them know there is still room at their table. There is a sign-up sheet in the vestry for the cookie decorating and selling, so if you feel you can participate in that, please sign up. There's also an opportunity coming up soon on November 30th at 9 a.m. if you feel you can be here to help with the hanging of the greens. Um, it's, it's just such a beautiful display and I appreciate it every year if you feel like you can participate and help with that. It is kind of a, a daunting task. Um, so many hands make light work. Um, November 30th, 9 a.m. If you would like to receive the link for the spiritual gifts assessment, please let Ken and Teresa Taylor know. There's still time to join in that fun. One way you can share your gifts is to participate in the Advent candle lighting and reading this year. Um, you'll find a sign-up sheet in the vestry. Lindy Mylot would love to hear from you if you are willing to help at the Manchester Food Cupboard in the month of December. Please speak with Lindy about days and times. Any gifts given to missions this month will go towards supporting the United Missions Basic Ministries that we learned about last week. Happy birthday to Lorraine Wilkins on Tuesday, November 22nd, and Kay Keith on Saturday, November 26th. And thank you to Cheryl and John for the flowers today in honor of their 49th wedding anniversary this past Thursday. Congratulations to Cheryl and John. This word of preparation uh, is called Eternity Changes Everything, and it's an excerpt from a devotional written by Laura Bailey. And she starts with telling a story from her life. The room overflowed with boxes. Clothes still secure in zipped suitcases assured me this was just a temporary layover. I was jobless and living in my brother's house. I felt like the prodigal sister, not exactly the life I'd planned. My brother graciously reminded me that my visit did not come with an expiration date. I could have unpacked in an attempt to settle into my new home, but placing my things in drawers and personalizing the room symbolized permanence. This was only a short-term stop, not my final destination. Eventually, I jumped back into the workforce, married, and moved into what my husband calls our forever house. This move meant permanent residence. Yet, I still wrestle with wanderlust a feeling that this house isn't really my home. Drawers and cabinets now hold all my personal possessions and family photos hang on walls painted in colors chosen by me. My bold personality resonates throughout our abode. So why do I still feel unsettled? Maybe you've felt this way. Whether you're in between jobs or you land your dream job, it's not enough. Whether you are in the midst of relational heartbreak or you're surrounded by family and friends, you still feel something is missing. Whether you're struggling to balance your budget or you have all the latest gadgets and a fridge full of food, you still feel unsatisfied. Why? Because God didn't create this temporal world to be our one and only dwelling place or to satisfy us fully. In other words, the here and now is not the end. In a key verse, explains why we feel tension when our perspective shifts from eternal to temporal. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. 
Child of God, embrace eternal wanderlust and keep your spiritual bags packed, ready to follow Christ. reading the call to worship together in your bulletin if you would please join me in reading the bold lines you are not forgotten for you have been chosen and destined by father god the holy spirit has set you apart to be god's holy ones obedient followers of jesus christ who have been gloriously sprinkled with his blood May God's delightful grace and peace cascade over you many times over. Celebrate with praises the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has shown us his extravagant mercy. For his fountain of mercy has given us a new life. We are reborn to experience a living, energetic hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are reborn into a perfect inheritance that can never perish, never be defiled, and never diminish. It is promised and preserved forever in the heavenly realm for you. Through our faith, the mighty power of God constantly guards us until our full salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. May the thought of this cause you to jump for joy even though lately you've had to put up with the grief of many trials. But these only reveal the sterling core of your faith, which is far more valuable than gold that perishes, for even gold is refined by fire. Your authentic faith will result in even more praise, glory, and honor when Jesus, the Anointed One, is revealed. You love him passionately, although you have not seen him. But through believing in him, you are saturated with an ecstatic joy, indescribably sublime and immersed in glory. For you are reaping the harvest of your faith, the full salvation promised you, your soul's victory.
would you join in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen.
final message about discipleship from the book of 1 Corinthians. And we began this journey actually on the first Sunday in September. And that day we learned about coming to the cross and the importance of it. We also went on to learn about the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And that's a member of the Trinity that our um, prayer group will be focusing on as we read our book, um, Help Us Here. It's not too late to join in if you'd like to do that with us on Tuesdays. We learned about maturing in our faith, what it means that we belong to God, body and soul, how to share the gospel, how to navigate times of testing and find the way of escape, using our spiritual gifts in loving ways and worshiping as a church family. And today we return to the heart of the gospel, <clears throat> retracing Jesus' path from the cross to the tomb to resurrection. As disciples, we're following Christ, so we are walking on that same path. God's design and invitation is to die with Christ and to rise in eternal life. In 1 Corinthians 15, which is kind of the big culminating chapter in this book, Paul writes about the seed going into the earth and dying and rising as a plant as an illustration of what the resurrection body is like and related to our, our present physical body. Christ also spoke about life and resurrection in terms of this when he was giving the disciples insight into his impending death on the cross. This is in John 12, 23 and 24. He said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is the seed, and he's willing to die to multiply into a crop of seeds that will become God's ultimate harvest. We may be grateful at this time of year for the harvest of food that nourishes our body, and that is a good and wonderful thing to do at Thanksgiving. But may we also consider the invitation to celebrate being part of God's harvest. First Peter 1, 23 to 25 says, for through the eternal and living word of God, you have been born again. And this seed that he planted within you can never be destroyed, but will live and grow inside of you forever. For human beings are frail and temporary like grass, and their glory fleeting like the blossoms of the field. The grass dies and, the wither and withers, and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Jesus, the living word of the Lord, endures forever. And if he is a seed planted in your heart, then you will rise to live forever with him and become part of the harvest. So with this image in mind, please listen with gratitude in your hearts to the essence of the gospel and its proclamation for the future that awaits us in 1 Corinthians 15. Our passage today is from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 28. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. 
For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he first he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. The first thing I notice about this passage is that receiving the gospel transforms us. And gospel, as you know, means good news. It's the good news about Jesus being the Messiah, God's anointed one, the suffering servant, the seed that is the living word, God's son, and our savior. Paul shares the gospel in a brief synopsis, urging the Corinthians to hold firmly to the word. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised the third day according to the scriptures. So what is Paul talking about the scriptures? Because the gospels weren't all written in part of scripture at this time. He was actually referring to the Hebrew scriptures. And he doesn't use words to let us know exactly what's in his mind, but a couple of the passages he might have been thinking of when he wrote according to the scriptures might be Isaiah 53. I'll read um, verses 5 and 6 and 11. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 11. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And then Psalm 16, 9 to 11 says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You will make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Jesus' death was not a surprise to God. 
It was part of the divine plan for redemption all along. And when people who knew Jesus recognized this truth, it changed everything for them. Paul gave some examples of people who had been transformed by realizing and encountering the risen Christ. The first one is Cephas. That means the rock in Aramaic. It was the name that Jesus gave to Simon. You might be more familiar with the Greek name, which is Peter. He was not exactly a rock of stability when Jesus was arrested or during his trial. Peter was the one who denied Jesus, even when he was questioned by a young lady at the fire. But after Jesus rose from the grave, he made a special visit to Peter and restored him and showed Peter that he was alive. Peter was completely transformed into a courageous witness, willing to be the preacher on Pentecost, willing to spend the rest of his life sharing the gospel, willing to die, even being crucified, just like Jesus, knowing that death would not be the end, that he would be resurrected. Jesus opened the way for Peter and all who would believe in the gospel to be in heaven for eternity. But Peter was not the only one who saw Jesus in his resurrected body. Jesus came to the disciples, came to Mary Magdalene. Paul even mentions that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at one time. We don't know exactly what that encounter was, but it could be the appearance in Matthew 28, where he gave the Great Commission in Galilee before ascending up into heaven. Some of the people who were there that day would still be able to serve as eyewitnesses when Paul first wrote this letter. And he said some of them are asleep, which means that they had already died. And then Paul mentions James. This is not the disciple James. This is Jesus' brother who watched him grow up and watched him do ministry and miracles but still didn't believe he was the Messiah all the way up through the death. But here Jesus made it a point to come to James in his resurrected body. And that's what it took for James to be transformed into a believer and a leader in the first church in Jerusalem. And he was willing to give his life rather than give up his faith. He was fully convinced that Jesus was alive. Paul then gives his own testimony of meeting the resurrected Christ. And it was not before Jesus ascended into heaven. It was afterward. Jesus somehow came to him in such a blinding light that he was not able to see until Ananias um, touched him. But when he came to Paul, he said, why are you persecuting me? And Paul realized that by chasing down people who believed in Jesus, people who had the eternal seed in their hearts, Paul was persecuting Jesus because those people were forever connected to Jesus. And when he accepted this truth and repented, he was transformed into someone willing to go to great lengths to tell everybody about this message. He knows he doesn't deserve to be saved, much less to have the honor of being this apostle sent with the gospel. In verse 10, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. So how about you? Have you opened your heart to receive the seed that is Jesus, the living word, able to transform your life now and for the eternal future? We don't receive the seed because we are good and because we deserve it. We receive the seed simply because we're open and willing to be changed, both now and then forever. Without the seed of the living word inside of us, we are what Adam was, dust, animated with the breath of God. But when we receive Jesus, we become part of his resurrection story. Peter, James, Paul, and many other believers 
dedicated their lives to preaching the gospel because they were completely sure that Jesus' resurrection was real and that Jesus is alive forevermore. They were willing to suffer and to die for this ultimate truth, knowing that eternal life in God's presence was what awaited them. Now Paul, with all of that inside of him, that great motivation for his life, he's heard that some of the Corinthian believers don't think that they will be resurrected. They don't believe in it. And some of the Corinthians had a Jewish background, so they had grown up with some hope of resurrection. The prophet Daniel, in um, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, wrote, There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So there was a belief in a, a big resurrection. And you can see this belief in one of the encounters that Jesus had when he was on earth. Do you remember when Lazarus died and Jesus went after he had already been put in the tomb and Martha came up to Jesus this is the conversation that they had. This is from John 11, verses 21 to 27. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Martha had great faith in Jesus because he is the Son of God. And Jesus could ask God the Father to restore her brother's life, even though he'd been in the tomb for four days at this point. She believed in the resurrection to come, but her grief inspired her to see if it was possible for Lazarus to rise right then and there. And in response to her great faith, Jesus thanked the Father for hearing him, and then he called Lazarus' name, and out he came, alive and well. Jesus didn't just have the power to resurrect a person. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Some of the members of the Corinthian church family were struggling with believing this. As we mentioned, some of them had a Jewish background and a belief in the resurrection at the last day, but most of them were Greek. And the Greek ideal is for the spirit to leave the body, never to be reunited. They would just be glad to be done with this old body. They didn't like the idea of God valuing the body and remaking it in an eternal form. But God's plan has always been to redeem humanity, body and soul. And that is why Paul takes us back to the very beginning of the human story. In verses 21 to 22, Paul writes, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ, all will be made alive. Adam's disobedience, along with Eve, plunged us into sin, separation from God, and eventually death. But Jesus Christ's obedience and death paid the penalty for our sins, reverses the curse, 
reunites us with the Creator and restores eternal life. So you might ask, why is there still sin and death in the world? We wish it was done, don't we? We are in the age of grace that Christ ushered in. And this is where we get to make a big decision. Are we going to accept that grace, that seed of life, or are we going to reject it? Someday this age will come to a close when Christ ushers in the new age, the thing we pray for every Sunday, the kingdom of God. And that's when the big harvest, the resurrection God's been planning for millennia, will occur. And Paul describes this back in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 and then 23 to 26. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. When he comes, those belong to him will be raised. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Jesus is the first person to experience resurrection and the eternal form of his earthly body that can now never be sick, never feel pain, or die again. He is the first fruits of the great harvest. And when God decides it's time for the big harvest, his thanksgiving, that everyone who has the everlasting seed within the soil of their heart will rise to attend his harvest home. Death will no longer be able to destroy anything because it will be destroyed. The serpent crushed under the heel of our Savior, fulfilling the very first salvation promise given in Genesis 3.15. I'd like to move forward in 1 Corinthians 15 to a part of the passage that Annie didn't get to read this morning, and it corresponds to this great day of the Lord. This is verses 49 to 53. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. There are two exciting things I'd like to highlight from this passage. First of all, when we are resurrected, we're going to have bodies like Jesus' resurrected body. Can you think about the appearances that were written about and what they noticed about him? They could recognize him. Sometimes his appearance was confusing to them and they thought they were talking to just a regular man and then their eyes were opened and they realized it was Christ. He was able to eat with them and walk with them and talk with them and be touched by them. He was not a ghost. He could also appear and disappear and he could go through locked doors, and that resurrection body could rise up in the sky. So if you would like to fly, you have something to look forward to. The continuity with his earthly body was there, but he also could leave behind some of the limitations that we experience now in this human body. The wounds that he had received from his beating just prior to the crucifixion were all healed. But he chose to keep some scars, nail prints on his hands and feet inside. I don't know if we will have a choice whether we keep any of our scars, but God's word assures us that 
our pain, our tears, and our wounds will all be healed. And if you want to read more about that, I encourage you to open your Bible this afternoon when you get home and, and look at Revelation 21. That tells us all about our life in heaven. And the other exciting thing I'd like to point out from the passage in 1 Corinthians is there are some people who will not need to die before receiving the resurrected body. Have you heard that saying, like there's nothing certain but death and taxes? There's an exception here. Some people will not have to die. Sometimes this verse um, is taken out of context and put in a little framed saying on a church nursery. <laughs> it says, listen, I tell you to a, a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. <laughs> the actual context, sleep, refers to death. If God decides that the time is right for Christ to return during our lifetime, we will be so blessed that we'll get to rise and be transformed without walking through that valley of the shadow of death. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We will be reunited with the Lord and with our loved ones, and we, we will have, all of us, new resurrection bodies. And you might be wondering, well, if they have to wait for resurrection for a body, what do they have now if they're in heaven with God? That is not specifically described in scripture, but I imagine that they do have a body that's suited to dwelling in the eternal realm, because it says if we're absent from our body, we are present with the Lord. But in the last day when heaven and earth are reunited and the earth is restored to all that god wants it to be a new resurrected body that's a form of our earthly body will be the very most suitable one what a wonder that god does not throw anything away and it is his great delight to recreate what he's originally created how then shall we live in light of this? The thing of first importance is to be prepared for God's great harvest, to make sure that you're not just animated dust walking through the life, but dust that contains the precious eternal seed of the living word, Jesus Christ. If you have Jesus in your heart, you no longer need to fear death. You can use the time that you have here to enjoy God's good creation, join him in tending and stewarding it well. You can enjoy the body that God's given you and care for it with kindness. You can wake up every morning looking forward to loving the people God's given you to be part of your life. You can grow in wisdom as you learn more about God's word and ways and how he designed life to be. You can share the good news with people who need the grace and truth and hope and purpose that God gives us. You can trust each day and everything you have to the God who holds time and eternity in his hands. And you can thank God for every good thing he shares with you, most of all, his Holy Spirit. You can pray and look forward to the day that God says is the day to bring the kingdom. You are part of God's story, and the ending is going to be better than any of us can imagine. I'd like to share in conclusion a quote from N.T. Wright. He wrote, the truth of the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living is not just a truth about the future hope. It's a truth about the present significance of what we are and do. If it is true that God is going to transform this present world and renew our whole selves, bodies included, then what we do in the present time with our bodies and with our world matters. This is why being a disciple of Christ, following in his path, matters. We may be one day incredibly blessed to never have to experience death, or we may die before Christ comes again. But no matter what happens, a glorious future awaits us on the other side. 
Would you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming and leaving the eternal realm to take on a body, to show us that our human bodies are valuable to you, to affect our salvation by your death and your resurrection. And Lord, thank you for including us in your resurrection. Help us, Lord, to live every day in light of that, to face every situation with the hope of resurrection, that every loss we have, Lord, every death we experience is not the final word. Life is the final word, and you have made it so. So we praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh praise His name forever
Corinthians 15. And when that which is mortal puts on immortality, and what now decays is exchanged for that which will never decay, then the scripture will be fulfilled that says death is swallowed up in triumphant victory. So death, tell me where is your victory? Tell me death, where is your sting? It is sin that gives death its sting, and the law that gives sin its power. But we thank God for giving us the victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. So now, beloved ones, stand firm, stable, and enduring. Live your lives with unshakable confidence. We know that we prosper and excel in every season by serving the Lord because we are assured that our union with the Lord makes our labor productive with fruit that endures. Amen.